Will Reese Hoskins be as tasty as a big old Reese's cup? Is he going to be like a Reese's peanut butter egg? Or is he going to be a dud? We're going to find out in this show because Kyle Gaffner, Tony Del Grosso, they're going to get in the ring. They're, they're, they're getting the boxing gloves on. They're going to go back and forth. Because if you guys watch their Phillies preview, well, Kyle, for whatever reason, doesn't think that Reese is going to have a big year. He's only got 22 home runs on the seats. And then you got Tony, who thinks that Reese could be a potential MVP candidate, hit over 40 home runs. So we got a huge disparity here. And uh, we'll get into that right now. So I guess I'll just play the mediator, the, the moderator, whatever the hell that role is. And uh, I'll, I'll just let you two go back and forth. I'm, I'm kind of in the middle. I got 35 home runs. So, well, that's a big season. But there you go. All right. So I'm going to let Kyle go first. So you're, yes. you're the heel. You're the heel. <laughs> You're the antagonist. So, what the hell, man? 22 home runs? I think he's anti-American. That's what it is. He's anti-American. He hates America. <laughs> You're right. I'm doing it just to piss everybody off and to be a thorn in everybody's side. Be bold, but- Gaffner. Be bold. <laughs> I am being bold. I'm making an, a, a bold statement, an outlandish statement like this. It's just there's nothing more that I like to be proven wrong. So I hope he goes out there and jacks like 55 home runs and, and isn't an, an MVP candidate. I just feel like he's going to struggle. Yeah, he came onto the scene last year. It was like lightning in a bottle. He hit, what, what was that, like 15 or 16 home runs within, you know, a short span of time. I think it was, what, three weeks? He, he was on fire. I mean, the dude was just knocking everything out of the park. There, and I just think that's because nobody really knew how to work him. They didn't see him. He was, he was new up to, to the majors, kind of like – now, I'm not saying he's like Don Brown, but in that sense that he, w- he went on a run, he hit them 20 bombs in June, Don Brown did, and then he just equated to nothing. Now, I think Reese is going to be a way better talent than that. It's just I think hitter, or, uh, pitchers are going to know how to work Reese a little bit more, and he's just going to be able to struggle. And I think playing left field is going to mess with him a little bit. I think he, he feels better being out there at first. And I think by signing Carlos Santana, it's going to play some mind games with Reese over there. Yup, that is my statement, and I'm going to stand by it, y'all. Go ahead, Tony. Officiate right. him. <laughs> Kyle doesn't celebrate Fourth of July, clearly. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I'll, just, I'll just start by saying this. Reese Hoskins is the best Phillies prospect since the Utley Rollins Howard era. Hands down, like, it's not even an argument. He's a better prospect than Kingery, better prospect than J.P. Crawford. He's the best prospect they've had in their system, and like I just said, like, probably like 15 years. Um yeah, I think he's going to struggle from time to time. But um, I just think uh, – I think 22 home runs is, is low. Um, I'm looking at some of the projections here from, uh, like, some of the analytics. And the composite has him at 34 as a projection. Um, the highest is 37, lowest is 32. Um, I, I think he, he's going to have a great year. I, I just said 42, and I think he's going to end up top three the NL MVP. I just um, – I don't really see a weakness from this guy. He's the most polished um, hitter um, from, a, from, well, from a Philly, obviously, at that age in a long – I mean, he's more polished than Utley was at his age, which is crazy to think. Um, in, in last year, he had 37 walks to 46 strikeouts. For a guy who hits with as much power as he does, to be able to walk almost as much as he strikes out, um, is just why I don't think I don't think there's going to be any type of regression. If anything, I think he's going to learn more. And um, yeah, you know, once the league sees him around again a second time, they're going to um, some pitchers might find weaknesses here and there. But I don't think it's going to be able anything. Uh, he's not going to be able to adjust to. So uh, I guess I just uh, very much disagree with you, Kyle. Yeah, okay. I mean, hey, everybody's in of their pain. That's fine. I just think that, you know, the pitchers and the league is going to do their due diligence on Reese Hoskins. I think he saw a lot more fastballs last year. If he's going to be able to hit them breaking balls. Uh, and I'm not going to say he's going to be like Ryan Howard and striking out left and right and batting like 182. 
That's not what I'm saying. I just think his home run numbers aren't going to be as extravagant as we all think they will be. And, again, if he proves me long, I, wrong, I would love nothing better for that to happen. If he can go out there and hit 40, 55 bombs, I would, I would be ecstatic. All right, quite a question for you, Kyle. So, yep. 22 home runs now. Do you think he'll also have a low batting average? Low? No, 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 no. I, I you like think I said, the batting I average will be good, but he's just not going to have a lot of pop. I just don't think he's going to have as much pop uh, that he did last year, just because I think he'll get a lot more breaking pitches, a lot more sliders and stuff. Uh, now, I think this could be dictated where he bats in the lineup too. I think he'll be batting cleanup. Um, I'm not sure what Gabe's going to do, but I just. Yeah, he'll he'll still hit for a decent average. I'd say probably about two seventy five. I'd say give it give or take around there. I just don't think he'll have as much pop uh, because if you look at this lineup, who can do the most damage? Obviously, Reese Alan Althea. You, know, you got to watch for Reese because he has that power from all sides of the field. He can send it to right, left, center. I mean, this kid is a, a phenomenal talent. What he did last year, I just I feel like the league's going to do their due diligence and they're just going to pitch him way different. Yeah, now, I'm just just looking at his numbers from last year, and just again, so he had 170 at bats, 18 home runs. So that's a home run in less than every 10 at bats. 48 RBI. See it 259, 396 on base, 618 slugging. His OPS was over a thousand. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I know it's it's not a huge sample size, but it's not exactly the small sample of sizes either. 170 at bats, and the thing about it, the, the one of the main reasons I don't see a huge, um, you know, sophomore slump, if you want to go with that, that phrase, is because this is really what he's done in, um, what, four scenes of the minor leagues? Yeah. I mean, he's always been a guy who sit for a ton of power, got on base a ton, uh, walked almost as much as he strikes out. So, you know, I think the older he gets, uh, the wiser he gets, and uh, just the better he gets. Now you got now Kyle. You brought up Dominic Brown, and uh, now the thing is, is with me, in my opinion, it seems like Reese has a, a much better plate selection, and his on base percentage is a lot higher. Uh, I'm I'm looking at stats right now. So, uh, 39 walks uh, for for Dominic Brown in 540 plate appearances. This is 2013 when he had his you know all star year. His only good run that one month. Yeah, so 39 walks and a 324 on base. And you look at at Reese Hoskins, and he had 37 walks in only 212 plate appearances with with a 396 on base percentage. So obviously the 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 pitch selection is a lot better. And and that's that's the encouraging thing for me is is you know he's patient at the plate. He's not just going to swing at at every slider or or curveball that comes his way like Ryan Howard does. Uh, so, so that's that's kind of my take on on, on between those two individuals. Yeah, I, I think well, like, like the other like elite first baseman, um, like you know you mentioned Paul Goldschmidt before or Joey Votto. Even when they're not hitting home runs, they're both still getting on base. Of shit, right. and yeah. I feel like that's going to be the kind of guy that that Hoskins is. Yeah, yeah. and I think by getting the walks too, that's going to take down on his home run numbers. You know, because he's not going to be getting these fastballs right down the middle but with his plate selection the the way he can see the ball it it might benefit him because a pitcher might have to make a mistake and throw it right down the middle and we know it could leave the yard at any point in time so we got that that argument but uh, can we also say that his lineup is better this year and he's going to be getting more protection Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah. for sure. You look at the acquisitions. With, I think getting Carlos Santana, even though he's taken his spot as at, for ba- at first base, it's like I thought maybe Santana would hit cleanup, but, I, I mean, I don't know. But you're going to have more power hitters on this lineup, so it could benefit him too, depending on where you yeah. hit him. I, I think he'll be somewhere two through four. I heard he might yeah. even bat second. I, I uh, think that Gabe wants to yeah. keep him up at the top of the lineup, which which is fine. You, you get a lot of fastballs when you're, you're in the top three. Um, well, ba- batting your best uh, your best hitter in the two hole has kind of been one of the biggest trends the past couple yeah. of years. I mean, the Angels yeah. had Mike Trapp there for a while. Votto for the Reds has been there for a while. So it, it wouldn't be crazy to see Hoskins in the two hole. 
No, it, it makes complete sense because they just know how to get on base. I mean, it makes perfect sense. And, and if he can turn into a player like Paul Goldschmidt or more Mike Trout, I mean, God, what a blessing that would be. It'd be, you know, it'd be awesome. And I do like what Gabe's going to do too, how they're going to bat the pitcher eighth and then have a the guy, you know, so it rolls over the lineup. Uh, Tony La Russa did that way years, years before. Uh, any of them were doing this. And for Gabe to do it, it just makes perfect sense because, you know, your last out's the pitcher, then you just basically have a guy that's starting at the top of the lineup if it's a J.P. Crawford or whoever you have down at the, uh, at the bottom of the lineup. So I, I'm excited to see that. I mean, Tony La Russa is one of the best baseball minds. I don't know why people didn't do it more. What's, what's the logic behind having uh, Hoskins at two instead, instead of cleanup? Is it because of the on-base? Yeah, I definitely I mean, think it's, it it, it, it's basically the on-base and just the fact that over the course of 162 games, that means he's going to get anywhere from like 20 to 30 more at-bats. Yeah. 20 to 30 more at-bats is whatever X amount more runs. It's basically how it's looked at. We saw Aaron Judge hit a lot from the two-hole. Yeah. All that, too. Yeah. So it, it, it is a new trend that we're seeing in baseball. And, and obviously the Phillies this year, they're going to be trying a lot of new things and, and trying to be ahead of the curve uh, when it comes to a lot of these different situations. So it starts Thursday, f- gentlemen. It starts Thursday. Yeah. It's exciting. I can't yeah, wait. It is exciting. It really yeah. is. He's going to be bold, baby. Gabe Kapler. Awesome. Just doing stuff. Wait, wait till you see what this guy does. Like, I'm telling you, like, Mid-pitch, he'll have left and right field switch. And then after the next batter, I'll have him switch back. And then he'll have, like, the shifts are amazing. Like, it's just mind-boggling. There's always something going on. So, it's going to keep your attention a lot more. And I know they're trying to speed the game up, too. So, they've changed it with that. I think they got rid of the pitch clock, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, they tried yeah. to do that last year, and they got rid of it this year. Uh, but they're, they're trying to get new youth into it, get baseball more to be more and more exciting. And I think analytics is definitely the way. Score a lot more runs. Just like in football, they're not going to get rid of the P.I. rule because it's too much offense. Well, in a sense, they're going to do that with baseball because what makes it exciting? Lots of runs. Home runs, so on and so forth. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to see – um, because eventually at some point, it's a long season, you know the Phillies are going to go through slumps, they're going to go through times, they look awful. And I just can't wait to see uh, the media back and forth between Kapler and, um, I mean, oh, can I just say the, like, uh, the old white writers in Philadelphia, the guys like Eskin who he's going to be pissing off. And you know, what I, I'm, you know what I'm talking about. There's just guys who think certain things should be done certain ways. And oh. uh, they're old. They don't like change. They don't like the analytic way, and they're going to try to rip his head off saying, why do we hire this guy? Kind of like when the media ripped Doug Peterson a new one and said he was the worst hire in 20 years. And it looks like he proved the, him wrong. Yeah, the back and forth, I think, is going to be great because there's a lot of uh, old curmudgeons in Philadelphia who are, are going to hate the things he does. Colangelo being one of them. Bob Ford immediately comes to mind. <laughs> that guy. Yeah, Ford. Uh, Angelo Cataldi, Howard Eskin. Angelo Eskin. A couple of local guys up here, Nick Fierro of the morning call. <laughs> <laughs> you know I was going to say that. He and I have gotten into a back and forth. I, I mean, there's a lot of guys. But there's a lot of guys who, who, are, who are, not, uh, are not supporters of Gabe Kapler right now. Like, he already has a bit of a base that's just no matter what he does, they're going to be against them. And it's not big and it's not very vocal right now. But if they, if they start off the year, say, you know, 7 and 15, all of a sudden these people are going to come out and say, oh, see, he's crazy. So, you know what? He's yeah. not going to let that noise get to him. He's just going to continue to play his own style and just drive it in, and it's the right thing to do. Who cares what all that out noise, you know, all that outside yeah. noise is yeah. not going to matter. The, the bottom line is him and the players know that what they're doing is the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's all that matters. As long as you get your players to buy into it, that's all that matters. Right. Yeah. And I think they have. I really do. All right. So, we'll, we'll talk about Scott Kinger just real quick uh, since we didn't really get a lot of time on, on our Phillies preview. So, 
they, the, the Phillies go the Jonathan Singleton route where they, they pay him before he's even played a game, uh, basically. So what are your guys' thoughts on, on the Kingry deal? That didn't work out for the Astros, but he's not Jonathan Singleton. Uh, th- this guy is – way above average prospect. I think he's one of the better – I think he could fill Otley's shoes, really. But I think it was a great deal, and it shows you that the organization and the Phillies brass, they're ready to move forward. They're solidifying this. Why worry about bringing him up in April for another year of arbitration? No, nah, we'll throw this big contract at him, and we'll have him locked up potential until 2026. So it's a great move. You know, for the offense, defense, if Mikel Franco struggles, you stick him over at the hot corner. You just have to have this kid on the field. He's produced down in every level of the minors. He was too good last year. He should have been brought up last year. The, the kid was unbelievable in spring training. He needs to be on the field. He just can flash the leather and hit, get on base. He, he can do it all. You might even see him play outfield, too. Yeah, I think there's a chance you, we might see him at center field every now and then. Um, so basically two things. When the Phillies signed Arietta, that was their way of saying, hey, yeah, we're going after it this year. We think we could compete. We think we can make the playoffs. And then, you know, them going back and forth about how, well, you know, you, you always hear Kapler talk about, you know, the margins and doing that, every, the, you know, getting that 1% extra. Um, that might sway a game here and there. And you're thinking to yourself, well, if you really want to win that bad, shouldn't Kingery be up opening day? Because that extra two, three weeks of him might give you that extra win or two Mm -hmm. that you need come September. But you also understood the business part of it. And it was much smarter to have Kingery an extra year than it would be for a couple weeks in April, blah, 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 blah. All of a sudden the news came out and bam, Phillies are, Phillies are really going after it. Um, I will say that uh, if Kingery becomes close to the player he's projected to become, this might be one of the most team-friendly deals in all of sports, really. I mean, they could absolutely be robbing him a mm-hmm. few years from now. Um, just, I mean, I mean, look at – okay, I'm not saying he's going to become Jose Altuve. Uh, that's who I was going to say. That's who he's he reminds me of. Yeah, he, he's light years – oh, can you hear me? Yeah, <laughs> drop the phone. <laughs> yeah, so um, I mean, he's light years away from that. But if you're, you know, projecting for the future and having getting better in every facet of the game, up two base is the best second baseman in baseball. So you're hoping he could replicate even a shell of what Altuve is when you're. Point being, Altuve just signed for what 150 million dollar contract. Yeah. Um. So I, I mean, Kingery, you know, you're getting him through all his prime years. Um, even if even if they end up uh, giving him the three options at the end, I think the maximum he can make is like sixty some million dollars, sixty four, something like that. So, like, really, it's just a genius move for Puntak. But I mean, on the other hand, you could understand uh, Kingery's side of it too. I mean, would you be able to turn down twenty four million dollars? Nope. So, um. Really, the only thing, and uh, one of my um, guys I follow on Twitter, Matt Winkleman, the only thing that separates Kingery from being like an elite prospect, I mean, people forget he was only like a top 30 or 40 prospect. He was never considered, um, you know, top five or 10. The only, the only thing that's separating him is his walk percentage. He simply just doesn't walk enough. Yeah. And that's something that any player can get better at, and certainly a player of his age. So. Yeah. If he becomes Dustin Pedroia or Chase Utley or freaking Jose Altuve or anything close to any of those guys, it's just absolutely great uh, team-friendly contract. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right, so we'll, we'll use this forum uh, before we depart. Anything that we missed in our preview show, if there's anything you guys want to discuss, bring it up right now. Tony, do you have anything? Uh, I need a minute to think. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I don't know if uh... I, I think we pretty much covered all bases in the preview because I I got like once I got that message that we had ten minutes left, I kind of went quick with the topics and, and condensed and condensed things per se. Yeah. So uh, I I went really quick. I think we pretty much covered everything. We went through the lineup. We talked. The only thing we didn't really like focus on that much was was the the bullpen 
And it, it is a pen that uh, actually excelled uh, at the end of the year. So the final 33 games, they had a 2.54 ERA, and that was second to only Cleveland uh, during that time frame. So uh, you, you add Pat Neshek to the fold. Uh, they did lose Tommy Hunter. But uh, the, the, the bullpen, I, I, it seems like it's going to be a strength in, in the way that uh, Gabe Kapler is going to use it. I mean, he kept more pitchers than, than positional players. No, uh, this is going to be one of those things, man. Like if if Vince Velasquez, if if he's struggling and he's he's throwing balls, it might take him out in the third inning. You know, like they're they're going to go to their bullpen early and often. Well, what worries me, the only thing about that really worries me about the bullpen is who's going to close. I don't think Hector Neris is going to be able to have that pressure. You know, you have to have that swag about you to really close out games in a pressure cooker situation and. He's the perfect setup guy. I just don't think he'll be able to close out games for us. So that will be a question mark for me. And I don't like Edibari Ramos. I wish we would have got rid of him and brought up a, another young arm in Yaxel Rios. I thought could really excel in the bullpen and get rid of Ramos. And we need more left-handers in the pen, too. And of all the 13 pitchers we got in the pen, we only have the two lefties. So, But bringing Nishak back was awesome. Love to have him here. Just his, his ability to get batters out and his arm angles, it's great acquisition to get him back. So we basically stole three prospects from the Rockies by trading <laughs> them and then getting them back. Yep. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, my thing, I just think that Kapler has a lot on his plate. Um, and He's brought a lot on his plate. He asked a lot to be on his plate. But if you really think about it, um, obviously excluding the pitcher, for the eight positions every night, you really have ten guys that you're trying to get in there um, because you have four outfielders and you have an extra infielder now in Kingery. And every single one of those guys, ideally, you want to get uh, four or five hundred at bats. So that's going to be really difficult, especially for the first couple months um, before they make, you know, kind of that inevitable trade that we all think they're going to end up making for a pitcher, um, which will you know, shake out some more playing time for Kingery eventually, and then eventually only have, you know, three outfielders. But Kapler wanted this. Kapler uh, believes he's going to be able to take advantage of this. He's going to go, you know, matchup by matchup. By matchup. Are we okay? Is that, yeah, you're good. Yeah. You're good. All right. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just, um, and like, you know, you were getting into the bullpen. Who's going to close? I think Kapler is going to be one of those managers who uh, he's never, I don't really think, going to designate a closer per se. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to have maybe a different – out of, let's say, they have five wins in a eight-game span, I think he might have four different closers for those wins because he's just going to put guys in matchup to matchup, inning by inning. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I – you know, I know um, the players might not like that, especially the guys who, like, you know, more defined roles, um, mm -hmm. especially for the guys who have, you know, saves in their contracts as bonuses and whatnot. Yep. But I just think that's that's the new wave, and I, I don't think it's going to be something that's unique to the Phillies and Catholics. because I think there's going to be a lot of teams that – I mean, it's it's not like it hasn't started already, but it, I think it's just going to be, become more prevalent. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think exactly. by, you know, in a couple of years, there's only going to be a handful of teams that have true – you know, ninth inning closers. Everyone else is just going to have a bunch of guys who, you know. Go out there are, are and do a job depending on matchups. Yeah. I guess the only other question I would have is, do you, do you guys have any problems with the, the players who got sent down or anything? The only one I was kind of disappointed in was uh, Roman Quinn. I thought he yeah. a lot last year. He had a really good spring. I completely agree. Uh, I think he got robbed. I think his tools could be really utilized up here with the big club, not only his legs, but his bat, too. I mean, the kid can get on base. He can steal bags for us. Uh, you just can't, you know, teach speed. His ground that he could cover out there in any position, you know, center field or left or, or right, any outfield position, it just he could track down a ball like in the blink of an eye. So I think he got robbed, and he should be up for the big club. Um, I mean, I, I like, I like Roman Quinn a lot. I think he, there's still a future there with him, but 
like we just talked about, there's pretty much 10 guys for eight spots right now. Yeah. And he would have made it seven. And you don't want a guy like him only getting one start a week or only getting five at bats a week or something like that. So um, once once they decided to give to have Kingery make the uh, opening day roster, that was to me that was kind of definitely the last draw for Flynn because now Kingery gets that super utility role. Um, there's it's just a numbers game. There's just really no no room for him. You don't want him to be your your fifth outfielder. Um, you know, or your seventh infielder. So, well, remember, yeah, yeah they were playing him a lot at short this spring, and he looked horrible there. Kind of like Reese looks, you know, an eyesore at left field, and I don't really like that. So, I wonder if they're going to trade Santana at some point. Do you guys think he'll be trade bait, at, depending on what he does, so we can get Reese over at first? Because he just looks so out of position when he's out there in the outfield. And I think it would be better to have Roman Quinn out there then a Reese Hoskins. If, if Reese really str- – like, I, I think they'll try it for a year. Like, <laughs> they're going to experiment with it for a year. Let him kind of learn the position. And if he's still struggling after a year, maybe you consider trading Santana like during the offseason or something. But I, I, I would think for now he's on the team. You, so you don't think if he did have a good first half of the year, they try to trade him for whatever, a pitcher or whatever you could get for a Santana? You think they're um, going to try him out for a year? It, it depends if they're in contention or not. Right. Tony? Yeah, no, I, I, I see that very unlikely. Um, one, because the team's not going to want to give up a prospect or a pitcher uh, for Santana when they could have just signed him in the offseason. Mm-hmm. So there's, well, there's right. that right there. But they're also, I think, um, there's kind of like an – sort of like an underlying factor – uh, that people haven't really mentioned about Hoskins moving to left. I think one of the reasons is because eventually they see Jalen Ortiz as a first baseman of the future. Mm-hmm. Jalen Ortiz is a few years away now, which yeah. co- which um, coincides with the Carlos Santana um, contract. Mm-hmm. And he have, I mean, he's only been in like, you know, rookie by, he's really, really young. Mm-hmm. But most people will tell you three, four years from now, they think he's everyday first baseman. So I think that's why they're trying to see if Hoskins could be at least an average or at least uh, adequate left fielder every day in the big leagues. And there's also some people who will tell you that um, his upside in left field is just as high as it would be at first base because he was never going to be more than anything average at first base either. Yeah, so I think right. that's what's going on. Right. I, I just – yeah, I mean, I think he's, he's going to – unless he makes a fool out of himself every night, uh, which I, I don't expect. I, I think he's going to be there, and he's only going to get better. He's not like a terrible athlete. He's he's a good enough. I mean, he's not on, Pat Burrell. Pat Burrell. Right. Pat Burrell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. He's not Pat Burrell. True. I just don't know why they yeah. wouldn't try to work him in at the you know, the hot corner, maybe over at third, as opposed to putting him out in the outfield. I don't think he has the feet for third base. No. Probably not the hands. Yeah. True. All right. A- yeah. Anything else? Is that it? Yeah, I probably basically got it out. So that, that would be something to watch to see how Reese really kind of, if he digresses or he progresses out there in left field. That's something I want to keep an eye on. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Too so bad they're not an American League team. What's that? Too bad they're not an American League team because having a DH would solve a couple oh, of their yeah. Oh, yeah, I know. You know, because after we got rid of Tommy Josephs, it was like there was some hope that Reese would be playing some first because there was such a log jam with those three over there. Uh, you know, yeah. and the same with Ruck. We were wondering, where is he going to work into this whole equation? And then they cut him. So that just shows you that, you know, the organization is moving in the youth movement and get rid of the older guys that really don't have a place here. Even though Tommy Josephs is only 26, but – um, he looks fine. like he's 56, though. Yeah, he does. He <laughs> looks really old. He does look really, really old. <laughs> he looks he like looks older than Kapler. He looks like a cannoli. <laughs> he does. He's just <laughs> so jam-packed in a body. He's misshapen. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and you you can just squeeze him and, and goosh will come out. <laughs> oh, like one of those I have something to say. Go ahead. You know who sucks? Sorry, I got to get this off my chest before the season even starts. Ben Davis, <laughs> Tom McCarthy, you seem like a nice man, but find a new career. 
The whole, just the entire TV broadcast is absolutely atrocious, and it's driving away everyone 65 and under. I'm sorry, it's just absolutely terrible. And now that LA is only doing half the radio, I don't know if you guys know he's only doing the home games this year. Now the radio team isn't even that great anymore, which is really sad. So the Phillies have some work to do because where did LA, where did LA go? What happened to LA? He's only doing he's only doing home games this year. Really? Why? What the yeah. hell? He's he's getting old. He doesn't want to go on the road trips anymore. What? That's asinine. Yeah. yeah. So now there's like really no broadcast team to even listen to. Do you like Crook? Yeah. Do you like Crook? I could deal with Crook. He, I mean, he makes the other two like bearable ish, <laughs> but you know, Crook, he's not, you know, he's not a play by play guy. He's just kind of there to make some, some dumb comments, you know, some funny comments. He doesn't talk half the time. He's wiping yeah. food off his giant stomach. I mean, he's just a fat <laughs> slob. You sit, see there munching away on sausages, hot dogs, whatever they're feeding his fat ass. <laughs> It's terrible. And and what's his what's his face in the who who's out in the stands? Uh, the bull um, or oh, uh, Murph. No. Murph. Like I'm Murphy. tired of him. The the whole they just yeah man, they're bad. I, bad. I like I liked Matt Stairs. I didn't like Jamie Moyer. No, Jamie Moyer was terrible. I mean, how do you really follow up freaking Harry? You you can't. It's yeah. like we had the best right at the beginning, and now that he's gone, it's just – thank God Wheels is gone, though. I mean, he sucked. I mean, everybody they've tried to put in here has just been horrible. And Matt's at least, talking about hockey here. I may rather have Wheeler than, than Davis, I'll tell you that. I, yeah, Davis is I great. really – oh, my God, in a heartbeat. I would take Wheeler in a heartbeat over Ben Davis. At least, at least with Wheeler, he would, like, you would learn something from him, like, every night. Ben Davis has not said one intelligent thing in what two seasons now. He's pretty hard. He's, he's hard. He's awful. And Mike Schmidt's a racist, so you can't have him up there. <laughs> yeah. You, you need him on, old on, on a ten-second delay. <laughs> you know what? Hell, bring Chooch in, man. I think he would do a much better job than Ben Davis. He only speaks about two words of English, but. It would be ten times better than listening to to Ben Davis spew out that diarrhea that comes out of his mouth. I mean, the dude. They should a- give they should give Jimmy a call. Rollins did Ooh. did some uh, analyst work in the postseason. I like that. Maybe he's doing good. I mean, they the thing is though, they need a play by play guy too because McCarthy's awful. I mean, they they just need a whole overhaul, but. Yeah, a, some know. some new fresh blood, some new different perspectives. Yeah. I don't know if, if McCarthy's going anywhere, though. McCarthy, yeah, that's, that's I, I, I think key, yeah I, I'm with you. I don't like him either, but I think he's there for a while. Yeah, unfortunately, I agree. It's weird when you hear him talk about football. They wouldn't have kept him this long if, you know, that's the way I feel about that. He'll be, like, in there for the next, like, 35 years until he hits, like, wheels did, and then they'll just stick him somewhere in the organization to make him feel like he's still a part have of you, He's not. Have you seen his physique? He's not going to live another 35 years. <laughs> he might. <laughs> you never know. I bet you Kruk will he, outlive all of them. He gets bigger every spring training. You know what's going to happen is that we're going to get his son. Oh, God, you're oh. right if he doesn't. Yeah. Kind of like, did you see when, when Chris Collinsworth's son has a job? I'm like, are you kidding me? Chris Collinsworth. You know what his son's doing oh. now? Oh. M- McCarthy's son is, is going to be uh, the, the announcer for the Iron Pigs. Yeah. Yeah. Bullshit. It's all about who your dad is. Like, when I saw that it, Collinsworth's son was on that, I was like, it, it's all over from here. He's more annoying than his dad. All right. Yeah. So that that's it. You got it off your chest, Tony. You're good. I, hey, until they say the first dumb thing. Uh, <laughs> well, we got all season the rant, baby. We got we got 162 <laughs> games worth of, of nonsense to to get into. So uh, that's what we'll be doing yeah. all season long. We'll, we'll we'll be doing some Philly stuff, baby. You guys better be watching it. Because they don't always watch our stuff, unfortunately, with the Phillies. Nobody cares in Philly right now. 
until they're good, and then they all jump on the bandwagon like Eagles, the Eagles and the Sixers, and then only when they're good, it seems like. Yeah, well, we'll get to that point eventually. All right, for Kyle Gaffner, Tony Del Grasso, I am Adrian Fetke. Hopefully you guys enjoyed our, our Phillies content for the night. Peace.